Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Better Tech. My name is Peggy Sai, and I'm looking forward to talking about balancing automation and human expertise in data operations. I'm pleased to be joined by Audrey Smith, the Chief Operating Officer of ML Twist. Hi, Audrey. Welcome to Better Tech. Hi, Peggy. Thank you for having me today. It's great to have you here because I really want to share with the audience a little bit about yourself and how you became the journey of becoming the Chief Operating Officer. Sure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> And also love to hear more about really your, your passion for balancing human expertise with automation in data operation and really how that shaped your career. Sure. Uh, so I have a very um, uncommon career, I think, for data operation person. I started as a, an in-house lawyer um, in France uh, where I studied law for several years. And then I quickly decided to have an international experience. So I went to the UK for six years, stayed in the field. But when I arrived in the US 10 years ago, I really wanted to go into tech. But then find my way in with my um, experience. So I decided to uh, go back to um, starting my career all over again. And um, I stumbled on data operation for AI very quickly. I got a job at a very famous company in the Silicon Valley, working on a voice recognition app. And I was actually, as a French speaker, looking at the transcript and uh, looking if there are some updates that were needed on the transcript uh, in French. And that's how I started. Uh, that's how I learned about data labeling for AI, what it means, what's the power of that, what, what it makes to a, like an algorithm performance and and so on and so I did that only for a few weeks but enough to you know um, really get excited about that I then joined Google as um, a contractor for a few months this time more on the quality control side of things on several projects Google Shopping YouTube GDPR that was the really beginning of GDPR and then after that I joined Amazon that's where really I uh, stayed for four years and learn about data operation, especially for visual search. Uh, but I worked on all data types and was able to learn how to handle um, uh, data quality for AI product from uh, the time you get the data sent from data scientists to the time you send it back with annotation and high quality so that they can uh, they can train their model on. And that got really uh, exciting for me, working on so many different projects for Amazon. I then joined Labelbox, and that's a startup that was Series A at the beginning uh, when I joined. And I was the first person on data operation services, helping Labelbox customers with their data operation, uh, build a team around me. Um, and that was also very exciting to be in a startup environment with everything going fast and and the uh, decision making ma made on the fly sorry um and then and then two years ago i joined ml twist as uh its ceo and really ml twist is at the heart of what you were talking about which is the crossroad between automate automation automatization sorry and um and human input how to make sure that everything that can be automated in the process of data operation for AI is automated, but also uh, keeping an eye on the high quality of the data that's needed to train a high performing model and how to make sure that human input stays in the loop and make sure that everything goes smoothly. Uh, and that's what we've been focused on for the past two years. And that has been a great journey so far. Wow, Audrey, amazing, amazing background on a, a lawyer turned technologist turned mm -hmm. data. And I loved how you, sp um, certainly the influences of GDPR um, certainly um, helped you along the way, I'm sure. And it's so fascinating to hear about your, um, you know, the, you know, just the, your, your knowledge of uh, other languages kind of gave you that perspective on proper labeling and tagging 
of data. And I think that's where we see a lot of human errors, right? Or even errors with machine labeling is that not really fully understanding the language and the context. And I'm sure, as you mentioned, a lot of companies struggle, right, to how they automate that tagging and labeling and needing, requiring the, the human intervention to could do that right corrections. Um, so from your perspective, and uh, if you could elaborate, what are the key factors that's that's the right balance for organizations that want to do all this automation for the right data in their pipelines, but need the human intervention to to validate and you know verify that information as well. Right, that's a great question. I think as a data operation person, I have always in mind three different metrics that really matter to any data project, uh, and that's the quality of the data the requirements, what type of accuracy level do you want to achieve? Some companies are going to be okay with like, you know, a low accuracy because they want to go fast and they want to have something out there and then they're going to improve over time. Uh, you're going to have to look also at the time. How long do you have to deliver your data and productionize your AI product and the budget that you have in mind? Obviously, like, you know, you want to have the highest quality possible, but you have a certain amount of money to spend. So, you have to dense that dense. You have to look at the three metrics and see how you can make it work somehow uh, with whatever you have in your hands, the time, the money, and, and the quality that, that is required of you. Um, and that's that's something that's gonna change over time, depending on the organization, depending on the, you know, like the priorities in, inside your organization. And you need to make sure that you're gonna be able to balance technology with human input, as you mentioned. I don't believe that there is out there one tool that's going to make it all go away when it comes to human input. And I would go even further. I think that it we should require to have an input in, in human input no matter what. Even if we think that the highest quality possible is going to be achieved uh, just by using some tooling, which I don't believe. Um, you still need to have that human eye on it. And and why? Just because of, you know, like what is coming now uh, and like that's a hot topic of discussion, like responsible AI, how to make sure that you're, uh, the, you're tackling the data bias in the data sourcing that you're doing. And, and, and the machine is not going to talk to you about that. You need to have a human input. It's, it's going to vary if you're talking to people also in different, uh, countries with different cultural backgrounds. So it's like, you know, like it's, it's a, we are in a human society and having a human input is definitely something that should not go away over time. Um, and, and I believe that we are going to be able as a data operation people in all those organizations to be able to balance all that all those consideration and find the right balance for each project that's never going to be the same from uh, one use case to another one. Um, and as you mentioned, like for text annotation, it's going to be a requirement that's going to be different from image annotation and from video annotation because technology is evolving uh, and you're going to have super tools out there that are going to be able to do most of the work, even though the last milestone should be still done by a human, human eye. And those those are really great metrics, and I love what you said in the beginning about threshold for data quality that will determine you know how much um, you will let go be acceptable from an automation point of view. But do, I'm sure as the COO, you have lots of stories of scenarios mm -hmm. or projects where really the balance between human and oversight and automation, you know, played a significant role. Maybe either positively or negatively impacted the outcome. Can can you share any stories with us today? Yeah, of course, I, I have a lot. I think uh, MXPRIS is all about like trying to connect the right tools to the right use case. And so when you, you get a customer with a new use case, you look into that, you look at the tools that are out there, you look at all these companies that can like definitely talk about, oh, we can do all the pre-labeling, we don't need any human input and so on. And so, we test them. That's our job to see which tool is going to be uh, the best one uh, out there for the use case. And one example that's particularly still true to this day, even though it happened to me a few years back, is uh, videos 
um, recorded with uh, drones. If you think at it, those drones that are not super stable, that are subject to like moving a lot, depending on the winds from, you know, left to right. And then depending on who is piloting the drone, that's going to go up and down. When you're a labeler, and I think you have to go through it as a labeler to really understand what it means, uh, it's it's a nightmare because you're going to have every single frame on a video that's going to be different. And so when you think about it, you have tools out there that are now using interpolation or AI and hence, you know, labeling to tell you, okay, just use my tool and you're going to have annotation on every single frame. And then if there are some mistakes, more or less, you can go and have a human, like a person who's going to go and adjust the annotation on certain frames only, and you're going to be good to go. For drug videos, this is not the case. And as of today, it's still not the case. Using pre-labeling or interpolation can actually be very counterproductive uh, because every single frame for drone videos is going to be a little bit different. So you're asking basically a laborer to go and readjust every single annotation on every single frame. That's, that's just like going to cost you more money than if you were doing 100% manual work. And that's going to be uh, obviously very time consuming. So you have to adjust. And that's that's what I'm really like trying to uh, tell your audience is that depending on the context, depending on the use case, a tool is going to be your ally or it can also like uh, make your, your life more difficult. So really being able to assess your tooling before starting any job is 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 uh, mandatory, definitely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. And certainly um, some common sense should also be um, applied as well. I mean, certainly, as you mentioned, there's such a rapid advancement of AI and all the different machine learning technologies. But as you said, the human aspect needs to play a continuous role um, in, in these technologies. In your opinion, are there particular skills or mindsets that professionals should cultivate uh, to stay relevant? Absolutely. The first one I think is to make sure that you stay up to date with all the technologies out there because that keeps happening. Uh, at one point we were looking at, we were tracking the number of data labeling tools and it was like almost like one every month that was appearing uh, with different technologies, different capabilities different focus on like data types and so on. And so I think it's very important to stay relevant, to understand the technology that's out there and to assess it. And one easy way to just go for it and then try it because a lot of them are just like free trial and you can just like, you know, uh, use it on like some sample of your data and see what, what it does and what's the performance of it. I think it's also very important to understand uh, the difference between the hype that you can see on LinkedIn about all these like posts, posts that you see about new technologies coming to the market that are supposed to revolutionize everything. Uh, one thing I believe is, is very true at the moment is that there is a big gap between what you can see on LinkedIn and what is happening in like real life with your customers working on AI nowadays. They will always be more cautious about spending money on a new technology if they don't know what the ROI is going to be and it's going to look like. It's not just that they're going to jump on the first, you know, uh, new tech out there. They're going to try it. They're going to assess it. It's going to take time. So just be cautious that, yeah, things are going to be a little bit more real in like in your day to day than what you can see on LinkedIn. So I think those two things are very important. And again, um, being able to understand the importance of responsible AI in whatever you're doing. I am very passionate about that. And being able, as a data operation person, a human in the loop that is here to orchestrate everything that's going on on the data side, that, uh, you know, data sorting matters and the workforce you're going to be selecting to work on your data matters and the tool that you're going to be using, like in terms of uh, certification, for medical uh, data, are you using a FIPA compliant tool and, and so on and so on. So there are a lot of different things to take into consideration when you are at the heart of that, uh, of the development of an AI product. Oh, absolutely. And, and certainly, as you said, that learning curve is 
can be very steep, but it's continuous, right? In terms of all the different technologies um, that's happening. And it's a very interesting fact that you shared that there is one new data labeling tool almost every month. And I'm not surprised, right? Especially with all the generative AI spurred a lot of new startup companies. So there's um, lots of new opportunities out there. But to look Let's talk more specifically about uh, ML Twist. Um, specifically, mm-hmm. your company, you know, it focuses on enabling data scientists to really concentrate on the data science aspect of it, rather than the manual labeling, uh, which can be, yeah. you know, tedious. So, how do you ensure that the automated aspects of your platform integrate smoothly with the human elements? that, you know, like creativity and problem solving that's inherent also in data science? Absolutely. That's a great question. We are here to help data scientists. We're not here to replace them. If you look at the numbers out there, it's a, there is a famous a statement that says that almost 80% of the work of the data scientists right now is focused on data cleaning. Yeah. We want to shift that. Uh, we want to make sure that they spend more time on, as you mentioned, the creative part of their job, making sure that they have like uh, some new ways to get the data they need for uh, for training their models in, in, in the best way possible. Uh, and so we want to be more focused on the janitorial work uh, that they shouldn't be doing in the first place, which is the pre and post processing of the data. How to make sure that the data is chunked in the right way is reformatted for the tool that they're going to be using because we have to keep in mind that each time that you're going to connect with a tool out there uh, to to somehow enhance your data, you're going to have to reformat it to the format accepted by that tool. You're never going to be able to use the format that you have, you know, and just like uh, inject it in any tool that doesn't work that way. So we are automating all those pieces that seem to be like kind of boring and unsexy for a data scientist to work on. Uh, we are connecting um, and creating pipelines that's connecting ML Twist platform to their cloud storage so that we can take their data out automatically. They don't need to do anything and we're going to inject it directly into the tool that's going to be the best for their use case in the right format. And once the data has been labeled by a workforce that they have or that we can also provide, um, then we are reformatting the data in the format they need to train their models. So all of that goes away and they can just, you know, focus on, on what matters to them uh, and what they, they studied for, which is training a model uh, the best way possible. I think that what you just described is, you know, often, you know, overlooked or, you know, misunderstood. One, the data cleaning part is 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 very tedious and a, a huge part and a waste of the talent, right, of your PhD data scientists. Um, and and the secondly, the consistency that you can do at the beginning of this data pipeline process with the tagging and labeling is, you know, provides tremendous value for the downstream users um, and either with automating controls and policy. So it's it's really key. And I think that a lot of um, executives on the, on the business side kind of overlook that. So I, I love how you um, okay. highlighted that. Uh, I know earlier you talked about you, one of your passion is responsible AI and love for you to discuss how ML Twist is tackling um, responsible AI and how data cards will change the way AI companies will take responsibility for their AI data sourcing and development. Right. Um, I think it's a very important piece that we are developing at ML Twist. That's something also, by the way, that has been tackled by Amazon that just like they, they, um, they also released that uh, just like a couple of months ago. But the idea is like really simple. It's like having that like ID that any company can show for any data set they're working on, right? And they're going to be able on that ID card to say, hey, this data is coming from there. It went to that tool and it went to that type of uh, of workforce. And that actually was used by Stanford um, AI department, which is one of our customers. Uh, and they published a research paper 
on text annotation, uh, mentioning that they were using our data cards. And so that's, I think, very crucial because it's very important. And especially with like the, the advancement of AI that we are able to somehow give some sort of responsibility um, you know, back to the, the people who are developing the AI products. They need to be able to, to be accountable for the way they are using the data. Uh, and that's going to be, even we're going to go uh, further, it's, it has not been completely done yet, but we want to go even further with that and tackle also uh, data bias. For instance, we want to be able to say that the workforce that has been lab uh, labeling the the project as that type of gender or uh, is like that that age range um, coming from that country because we want to be able to surface uh, you know gaps uh, if the data is only labeled by men what does it do to your data if it's only labeled by uh, people that are very young like how depending on the target. Uh, the customer target for your AI product, it's going to really matter if your product is going to be able to react positively, uh, you know, to the to to your target, and so that means that it has also it has also to be done and labeled by people that resemble your customers in the end. So that that that's like the future of the data card for ML Twist, but we have been able already. Uh, to create that ID for the data set, especially on the tooling side and on uh, the location of the workforce uh, that you, you have been using. So essentially, you're providing the transparency, right, around around that data to right. reduce potential biases, and um, you're 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 making yourself very accountable uh, <laughs> to to your your customers and stakeholders. So. That's that's excellent. And um, just out of curiosity, uh, certainly in, in the U.S. and in, in Europe, there is a lot of, uh, you know, frameworks around AI Act, the, U the AI Act and those principles, uh, the U.S. You know, executive AI order. Does does ML Twist follow or uh, is engaged with those principles and priorities and and, and, and embed that? as well into your your operations processes yeah absolutely i mean like it's very important to follow what's going on on the regulation uh side of things for now we don't have clients in europe but absolutely uh if if like we get customers in europe we're going to have to follow eu regulation when it comes to to ai um data processing uh, that's also like some discussions are going on on that and where like absolutely the people we're talking to don't want their data to leave uh europe so it's it's a very important thing that we have in mind as we progress and as we grow and expand our uh the type of customers we're working with but yes we want to be part of that we think it's very important to uh regulate the way ai is used and as you mentioned transparency is the key and we are like fully transparent uh and that, that's that's our way to go about uh, working with our customers. Whatever they want to know about what we're doing is available to them. Absolutely. And I think that goes certainly hand in hand with quality assurance, right? Uh, there's always questions around, you know, the quality, the accuracy, the completeness when it comes to these type of um, data operations. So how do you maintain a, a high standard of quality when it comes to these automated processes? I'm certainly sure human oversight also plays um, plays a role as well. Okay. So yeah, quality control is also something that we have uh, we have in mind at MLTWIS. We have developed quality control features on our platform that can be uh, very simple, but that are not like I'm surprised that they are not done like more often, but Essentially, if you have, uh, once we get the output back from the data labeling tool, we have a feature that helps flag or send some warnings to the labeling workforce when something is different from, you know, what is like an outlier in, in an entire data set, how it was labeled a certain way 90% of the time and like those last 10% are like kind of different. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that there is that sending a warning to the workforce to get a final look and, and make the final call on what is wrong and what is not. And that 
tremendously impact the quality overall of the data set just by having those little things put in place. Another example is um, we are working a lot on video, so I, I talk a lot about that. But, you know, I mentioned that when we get videos from our customers, they are in certain formats that they want to use to train their model. Let's say like it's a Coco format. When that uh, video enters the data labeling tool, it has to be reformatted in the, in the format that is accepted by this data labeling tool. For very heavy videos, the quality control cannot be done directly on the platform because uh, it's just lagging. Uh, you're dealing with, you know, uh, workforces that are not necessarily with like, don't, don't have like very strong connections because they are based in other parts of the world. They cannot do a very thorough quality control on those videos directly on the tool. It just doesn't work. So we have developed a feature that's going to um, actually get the output back, reformat it in the Coco format that our customer wanted to use, and then recreate the movie uh, containing the annotations done by the labelers, and they can just watch the, the movie and, and see very um, what the customer essentially is going to see when they're going to check the, the work. Uh, and they are able very easily to check that, you know, an annotation has not been done correctly on a certain frame, and they can go back to the labeling tool and, and so on. And that's like a very iterative process that's like really impacting the quality of the work and they cannot actually that that has become like key to the quality control process on the workforce side that's not something they can just not do and we're very proud that we are able to provide that uh to the workforce to help them do a better job very interesting i i think don't i don't think most people um understand the the depth that takes especially for tagging um videos um traditionally data labeling has been mostly on text, right? Text formats. So um, other types of formats, you know, requires a, a, a different level of quality assurance. So um, great example. Uh, so Audrey, I know our, our time uh, has flown by so quickly. I, I <laughs> leave it for um, this great discussion that we've been having, um, but just, just to close it out, I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, our listeners uh, have certainly learned a lot uh, when it comes to automation and human expertise in data operations. Any advice you would want to share uh, or insights you want to share with, with our audience as your, as your closing comments for today? Sure. So uh, two things. The first thing is a reminder about the dance. You need to dance. I, I like saying it that way, but like really keep in mind the two metrics that really matter. Uh, data quality, uh, time and budget, and and try to balance them out based on on your priority. The second thing is that I creating with I created with a um, few other data operation persons a group called Data Ops for AI on LinkedIn. We are like around two hundred and fifty people now, and we're just discussing. We're just like asking for advice. There are some times where I get new data, so. Lately, I've been working on 3D annotation, like something very new to me. So how do I go about it? What tool would be the best? And so on. And I got like a tremendous amount of information from that group. So anyone interested to know a bit more about data operation and how to go about it uh, can join our group and, and uh, share their knowledge and, and ask their questions. Fantastic. Certainly encourage everyone to um, follow, connect with you, Audrey Smith, ML Text on, on LinkedIn, and, and join the data operations group as well. It sounds very interesting. I think I'll do the same as well. <laughs> well, so, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Audrey, for your time today. And um, hope everyone enjoyed today's episode of Better Tech and looking forward to seeing you again at the crossroads of technology and innovation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.